there's a lot of injustice in the world, and there are a lot of theological approaches to addressing that injustice. Well, the book of James is one of the books in the New Testament that addresses injustice quite a bit. <clears throat> James wrote to his fellow Jewish people in a very difficult situation. So he says in James chapter 1, verse 2, Consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Well, that covers a lot of things and covers most of our situations. What particular situations did James particularly have in mind? Well, in James chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, he speaks of the pride of the rich. He speaks he says the believer in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position because the one who's rich should take pride in their low position because they will pass away like a wildflower. So rich, well, maybe, okay, uh, two of them. <coughs> okay, sorry, I, I don't have... Um, I don't have the tech support to add in like cartoons and stuff like that. I'll, so, you know, if you if you don't like my video uh, visuals, just you know, listen to me on audio. Anyway, the believer in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their low position. The sun rises with scorching heat. It says the the rich person will will fade away even while they go about their own business. Now, keep in mind that what he meant by rich people back then is not well. It can mean a bunch of different things today. What it meant back then, usually, you had rich landlords who owned a lot of the land, and you had tenant farmers, basically serfs. This didn't start in the Middle Ages. It was already true in the Roman Empire, who worked the land for them. Or you had, in the urban areas, people living in high tenement apartment buildings. The upper levels were cheaper and also more flimsy and more apt to collapse. And they were, they, they provided just enough room basically to sleep in, and nothing more. So these were owned by, by wealthy people. And the wealthy people often got their wealth by exploiting the poor. They often got it by inheritance from people who had exploited the poor. But anyway, that's, that's how it was most often in the Roman Empire. So the pride of the rich prejudice for the rich, James chapter 2, verses 2 through 6. Suppose somebody comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor person in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the one wearing fine clothes and say, hey, you can sit over here, but to the poor person, uh, you stand there or sit at the floor by my stinky feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves? I'm just quoting the text. I mean, of course, no, no big deal. We would never uh, give better seats to certain people in our congregations today. But anyway, listen, James goes on to say in this paragraph, hasn't God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the, the kingdom that he's promised to those who love him? Well, that fits Jesus' teaching pretty well, too. These aren't the verses that we often quote when we talk about God supplying our needs. God does supply our needs. But we're supposed to care for the poor. Uh, of course, Deuteronomy is very big on that. We care for the poor, and then God will supply the needs nationally and so on. But you've insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you in the court, he says? And of course, back then, uh, your penalties, uh, the prejudice in terms of the, the courtroom, would all depend on your social status. If you were poor, you could challenge the rich. You could say, okay, I'm going to take you to court, but <laughs> nobody would listen to you. It was actually, by the second century, it's actually written into the laws with higher penalties for those of lower social status. But it was already in practice part of that at this point. Now, of course, we'd never have that today with churches refusing to disciplines somebody for adultery because they couldn't make it without their tithes or whatever. But anyway, the pay of the rich, James chapter 5, 
Now listen, you rich people, he says. Weep and wail because of the misery that's coming on you. Your wealth is rotted. Moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver have corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. Uh, sometimes we speak of like you know, being fattened for slaughter. Well, it's kind of that way here. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. Back then they paid people daily wages. They paid them day by day. And that was partly because they only paid them enough to basically feed their family, so long as there wasn't a famine, in which case you wouldn't have a whole lot more than that. Now, of course, not not everybody got that, but yeah, you, you, didn't, you didn't get a lot of surplus back then uh, for ordinary people. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You've lived in luxury, self indulgence You've fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. That's where we get that. So what do you think is the test that James is here as face? Ah, well, it looks like a lot of them are poor and they're being oppressed by the rich. Ha! Huh. But it's not just that. It's also the temptation of the poor to kill the rich. You see, this was a, a kind of a violent setting. Uh, people were fed up, not the fat and for the slaughter kind. They were fed up. They wanted, they wanted justice. And they were ready to take matters into their own hands violently. So we have various trials, but also a violent response. Chapter 1, James says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For human anger does not bring about the righteousness that God desires. Chapter 2 and verse 11. If you don't commit adultery, but you commit murder, you become a lawbreaker. Well, who, I mean, today we have a lot of people who say, ah, oh, yeah, I didn't, I, maybe I committed adultery, but I didn't kill anybody. Well, these were people who thought they were very religious. They never committed adultery. But, you know, the temptation to kill somebody, that was a little bit different. Chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father. With it we curse people who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Chapter 4 and verse 2. You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and covet, but you can't have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You don't have because you don't ask God. Well, you know, we've got plenty of incendiary rhetoric today, too. Rhetoric that could incite violence and that it, at the very least gives the implication we'd sure like to see something happen to somebody by the way we, the way we speak. Now, um, the poor people, though, at least they have they have a legitimate grievance, and you know the rich people in this context did kind of start it. Chapter five and verse six: You, you rich people, you've condemned and murdered innocent persons who were not opposing you. Well, later on, the high priest did this to James, the brother of Jesus, whom I take and many people take to be the author of this letter. And if you don't take it to be the author of this letter, it's probably evoking him in any case. So James, the brother of Jesus was standing for the rights of the poor, standing for justice in Jerusalem. And the, uh, the new high priest, well, the Roman governor Festus died, and so the, the high priest was the only one in power in Jerusalem at that point. He had James and some of his colleagues executed. Well, that was too much for the Pharisees who were very much in terms of, hey, you've got to keep the law. They said that was against the law. And so when the new Roman governor came, actually the high priest was deposed for this crime. Um, the, point, the point being, not everybody appreciated James saying, okay, don't, don't use violence against the rich. But they knew at least he was on their side. It's like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., you know, there were some people who wanted a more violent path to justice, but when they saw that he was assassinated, they stood up for him because they knew he was on their side, even though the methods differed. James's solution, we have this in chapter one, it kind of lays out where the book is going. Some people say, James is just a bunch of 
scattered thoughts, which is what people sometimes say about my classroom lectures. But no, James actually has a, a sort of an outline. Um, it's not in order, but introduces the major themes right at the beginning of the book. His solution to the various trials they're facing, endurance, wisdom, and faith. First of all, endurance. James chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. The testing of your faith develops perseverance. Well, James develops this same theme more fully later in the book. Uh, chapter 5, verses 7 to 11. I believe this is the NIV I'm using. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient the farmer is for the autumn and spring rains. They had the early and, and latter rain in Judea. Uh, and even though James is writing to uh, Jewish people scattered abroad, he is doing it, of course, from his experience and maybe, maybe a sermon material there in Judea. He says, the judge is standing at the door. So you too be patient and stand firm. The Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, siblings, or you will be judged. As an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets. We consider those blessed who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance. Now, James is not saying you can't speak against injustice. That's what James is doing in James chapter 5. The, the first few verses, he speaks against injustice. But he is saying don't take up weapons and don't incite people to, to violence. Um, we need to be careful how we speak. Speak as prophets of God, yes, but don't speak with disrespect to those made in God's image. Defend others made in God's image. So patience, endurance, he says, but also wisdom. James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let them ask from God, who generously gives to all without finding fault, and it'll be given to them. But not all wisdom is God's wisdom. And he revisits that theme in chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. Um, he contrasts two kinds of wisdom. The one, if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, don't boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom doesn't come down from heaven, but is earthly, fleshly, of the devil. For envy and selfish ambition, there you'll find disorder and every evil practice. So you've got envy, ambition, you know, uh, what's earthly, sensual, demonic. This is, this is uh, a bad kind of wisdom. You know, violence. Sorry. Uh, sorry. But the wisdom from heaven, the wisdom which is from above, is first of all pure, peaceful, gentle, or considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit. And what's this fruit like? Peacemakers who sow in peace, raise a harvest of righteousness, James says. So, You've got the, the wisdom that says, okay, well, the, the best method is to take matters into our own hands and strike back. And you've got the wisdom from above, which says, let's respond in peace. Let's be patient. God's got our back. You can't straddle the fence, James says. Go with either God's wisdom from heaven or the world's wisdom, which is earthly and demonic. And that's what we see in chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. As he goes on, after, after he's spoken of these two kinds of wisdom, he talks about avoiding worldliness. And worldliness here is not a matter of wearing earrings or beards, as they sometimes used to say when I was younger. What is the worldliness in this context? How do we resist the devil in this context? Well, he goes on to say, You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Don't commit spiritual adultery. Choose one side or the other, the world or God. Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So, 
How do we resist the devil in this context? How do we resist worldliness in this context? We resist the demonic wisdom, the devilish wisdom that is from the world that is just described in chapter 3. And we seek instead the wisdom which is from God. It's pure. It's not mixed with the other kind of wisdom, the, the wisdom that's peace-loving. Now, if you wonder why James has to stress this so much, keep in mind that James is martyred just a few years before a war breaks out where Judea revolts against Rome. And it eventuates in Judea being devastated and Jerusalem being destroyed, the temple being destroyed, and the survivors being carried off as slaves. Violence was not the wise path then. There have been a lot of just causes in history, and some of them have had oppression that's at a higher level than what James is talking about. I think in the case of genocide, maybe maybe force is necessary, but then some of them, some of them are not that uh, extreme. And when James talks even about what we do with our tongue. James chapter 3, and how we speak towards others, that should have implications for how we treat one another in terms of American politics, um, and well, some parts of the world even much more so. And it should, it should have implications for how we treat our spouse, how we treat others when we have disagreements. So <clears throat> James's implications cover a wide range of issues, although the particulars especially are relevant to his own situation. But we can draw principles from those that are very widely helpful. Well, he not only speaks of endurance and wisdom, he also speaks of faith. James chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. When you ask for wisdom, ask in faith, without doubt, because one who doubts is a double-minded person. Now, double-minded here doesn't mean like Oh God, I, I'm trying to trust you, but I don't quite have enough faith. That's that's not what it means. I mean, obviously we should have faith, but that's another story about what faith actually means. But when he speaks of double-mindedness in the book of James, it's pretty serious. You hear him use the same language in chapter four, where he says, "Come near to God, and He'll come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded." He revisits this issue of faith, single-minded faith, in chapter 2. Well, just like there's two kinds of wisdom, there can actually be something like two kinds of faith. James chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. Show me your faith without your deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. Verse 19, for you believe that there's one God. Hey, great, so what? Even the demons believe that and shudder. Basic confession of faith in Judaism. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elohim, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Yeah, the demons believe that. Just believing that doesn't save you. Just believing that doesn't demonstrate that you're obeying. If you really believe, the real kind of faith that James wants, it's faith that has action. And that really doesn't contradict Paul. Uh, Paul uses the language of faith differently. When he talks about faith, he's talking about just the real kind, not real and unreal. But Paul expects the obedience of faith, like Romans 1.5 and, and so on. So if you really believe God, it's going to change your life. Chapter 2 and verse 11, remember what he said. Hey, you know, I don't commit adultery. I'll be you commit murder, James says. So real faith has to really obey God's will. Uh, at least, you know, not that we're 100% perfect, but that's what we're shooting for, for sure. Now, James is pretty strong about showing your faith by caring for the poor. Uh, you know, there are disagreements today in terms of economic theories about how best to do this. 
So I'm not talking economic theories, which is outside my sphere of competence, but I'm talking about priorities and not living extravagant lifestyles when we could use those same resources to help people in need by whatever the best means are. I mean, we can, you know, compassion, world vision, SIM, um, um, IRIS. There's lots of Christian ministries that, that care for the needy and uh, lots of other, other ways to do it, Doctors Without Borders and, and, and so on. One final bit on this, though, before we go on to some other things James says. James chapter 2, verses 4 to 17. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Look at the example he gives. Can such faith save a person? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says, go, I wish you well. Keep warm and well fed. But does nothing about that person's physical needs. What good is that? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. We well, have stuff like that that Jesus said, stuff like that John the Baptist said. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff like that. Well, uh, by the way, yeah, one closing comment that I want to say about James. Actually, his name is Jacob. I don't know. Maybe King James just wanted his name in the Bible. James is a weird anglicization of Jacob. You know, in the Old Testament, we translate the Hebrew word Yaakov as Jacob. And Jacob was a common Jewish name in the first century. Yaakov comes into Greek as Yaakobos. Well, all the Jameses in the New Testament are really Jacobs. Go figure. Anyway, have a great day.